Strange, yet true stories. Tales from the light side, the dark side, and the other side. I'm Steve White. Strange Animals The forest can be a daunting place, full of mystery and darkness. For centuries, men and women have claimed to have seen strange creatures in the deep woods. Some of these creatures have been deemed urban legends or myths. But every year, mass sightings flood in. Are there still creatures that inhabit our forest that are not scientifically documented? Are these creatures that are considered a myth actually a reality? Here are ten stories that may turn your urban myth into an urban reality. 1. I used to live in Arizona, near a mountain sacred to the Pima and Maricopa Native American tribes. There were a lot of skinwalker rumors in the area. Just in case you weren't familiar with that term, a skinwalker is a person like a witch that can change into another animal, like a wolf. Others may call them shapeshifters. Anyway, my friends and I loved to go camping, and we were really excited to receive permission to camp near the mountain along the Salt River for a few days. Before I get any deeper with this story, you need to know that we are pretty straight-laced kids, and we weren't into drinking and drugs. Sure, we may have had a few drinks every now and again, but we weren't getting ripped every night. We mostly went out to share creepy stories around the campfire and hang out for a night or two. We all spent a lot of time in the desert, and were all familiar with the land and wildlife, and enjoyed learning new stuff when we could. The sun went down, and the stars came out, and it was beautiful. We were sitting around the fire, listening to the river and the animal sounds, and the crickets and cicadas, the birds. The moon was nearly full, and the desert was gorgeous. Suddenly, everything went quiet. Just the sound of the river remained, and even that seemed spooky. The air grew still and seemed to get cold. We heard rustling in the undergrowth across from our fire. Out steps a... Uh, I don't know what you would call it. My first thought was, that's a javelina. Javelinas are in the pig family, usually a brownish color. At their biggest, they only get to be about the size of an English bulldog. They're actually kind of cute, in their own way, I guess. This one wasn't. It was huge and looked jet black with glowing red eyes. It paced around a bit, seemed like it was moving around the fire so it could look each one of us in the eye. I have never seen anything look at me like that, and I have been around some crazy-eyed people before. Its gaze was cold and searching, like it could see through me. After what felt like forever but was probably no more than a minute, it finally backed up through the undergrowth. The night got warmer, and the normal sounds started up again. We spent the rest of the night very close to the fire and didn't get much sleep. When the sun came up, we decided it was best for us to leave. I really want to believe it was just a male javelina scoping out some territory, but every instinct I have says it wasn't. 2. This happened one night when I was about 10 years old, around 1996. I'm older now, but I remember this night vividly. We had just arrived in Warsaw, Indiana to visit all of our family members, which consisted of my aunts, uncles, and cousins. My aunt's and uncle's house is in the middle of the woods, where the closest gas station would take at least ten minutes to drive to. I've always thought their house was very creepy, but I never had any reasons to justify why I felt this way. By their house, about fifty feet away, was a lake where we used to go fishing when I was very young. After visiting with my family for about two hours, all of the adults decided that they wanted to go to a fancy restaurant and eat while the younger side of the family, including me, wanted to stay home and play video games because it was very rare when we were able to see each other. 
All of the adults agreed that I was old enough to look after all of them, so they allowed us to stay behind. After about an hour of playing video games with my cousins, I realized that I hadn't taken a shower all day because of the long drive to get to Indiana, so I decided to get cleaned up. After grabbing fresh clothes out of my bag, I told all of my cousins to stay in the room until I got back, because I was responsible for them. I went into the bathroom and turned on the shower, and was waiting for the water to get hot. This bathroom was one of the weirdest bathrooms I had ever seen. Inside of the shower, there was a window that had a perfect view of the lake. Near the window, there was a large air conditioner. After the water had gotten warm enough, I entered the shower and just stood there for about ten minutes because it felt so good. This is where my night turned terrifying. As I was taking a shower, in the corner of my eye, I saw something move. I had that feeling that someone or something was watching me through the window. The hot water was steaming up the window, so I really couldn't see out of it took my hand, and I wiped the steam off of the window. What I saw made me drop my washcloth and made me completely freeze. I saw what looked like a man that was about seven feet tall, with long hair standing by the air conditioner right next to the window that led to the shower. I couldn't move a muscle. The man had very long hair, which covered his face. He had long fingers and his nails looked like they hadn't been cut or cleaned for ages. His skin was the dark yellow color, the kind of yellow you see when you mix brown and yellow together. His eyes were a normal-looking shade of brown. He was just standing there, holding something, watching me as I took a shower. I couldn't figure out what it was, but it looked like a flask because he was taking sips out of it. As he stood there, I was scared out of my mind, but all I could think about was my cousin's safety and that I needed to get to them. After about two minutes, the man got really close to the window and started to smile. His teeth were as disgusting as his fingernails. To this day, I can still remember his face as if it had happened yesterday. After he looked at me for about 30 seconds with his face pressed against the glass, he backed away and just sat on the air conditioner, drinking whatever it was in his hand, staring at me like I was the only thing that existed in the world. The only thing I could hear was his laughter and the water hitting the back of my head from the shower head. I slowly used my left hand, which he couldn't see, to grab the towel off of the rack. I quickly threw the towel over the window to hinder his view of me in the bathroom. I quickly ran into the room where my cousins were, with just my towel on, and quickly told them to get out of the room and go to the back room and lock the door. The back room was the farthest away from the bathroom, and was one of the few doors in the house that had a lock. After they all ran in the room, I got the phone and called 911. I told them that a man was watching me through the window, and I was scared. They said they would be there as soon as they could. After getting off the phone with 911, I reluctantly went back into the bathroom. I slowly took the towel off the window. And to my horror, the man was still there. But he wasn't near my window. Or my air conditioner. He was near the lake behind the house. He stared at me for about a minute longer with a malicious smirk on his face. By this point, I was terrified, but I knew my cousins were safe. Then, like he was being controlled or something, he quickly did a 180-degree turn and walked straight into the lake, his body descending until I could only see the top of his head. Then, nothing. He was gone in a second. I could not believe my eyes. This only made me more terrified. I had just watched a man walk right into the lake like it was his home. I figured he would come back up after a minute or so. I waited another five minutes. He never came back up. To this day, I can't explain it. The police came right after that. They searched the area and found nothing. 
I have never been more terrified since. 3. I was in rural southern Missouri, nowhere near New London, which is in the north part of the state, right on the Illinois border just northwest of St. Louis. This was several years ago. I was driving down a dirt road in the woods near my home, so I was familiar with the road when I saw this creature, and it was only for a second, right in front of the car. It was night, but it was only about 20 feet away and very clear. I wasn't alone, but my passenger happened to be rummaging in her purse in the floorboard at that moment. Interesting, perhaps, however, was that she had been living in New London at the time and had only come home for the holiday. It so terrified me I slammed on the brakes, and she said later it was as if I had screamed and gasped at the same time. The thing was very tall, taller than a man, and black. Most startling of all was that it was in two dimensions, like a projection without a screen. It might have been composed of triangles with pointy ears on top of its head and pointy shoulders. The whole body was like two tall, narrow triangles side by side, overlapping with the points for shoulders, with an upside-down triangle at the top for a head. The overall impression was a blocky, abstract painting of Anubis wearing Darth Vader's robe, no legs or arms unless they were inside of the black field that was the robe. It just seemed to be a jagged black point sticking up out of the ground with a head on top. It had yellow eyes that pointed down as if the face were triangle-shaped, too. Here's the part I'm less sure about. I'm sure there were thin silver lines somewhere on the body, but I can't remember how they were exactly. There weren't very many lines, but it seems like they made sharp angles and crossed in sort of a complex way, possibly to denote very, very long grasshopper-type legs or arms. I can't even be sure if the pointed shoulders weren't really supposed to be the knees of these long legs. There may also have been thin silver lines on the face as well. But like I said, I only saw it for a second, albeit straight on. It was very startling. I haven't seen it since, though the friend who was with me believed she later saw the figure once in a hotel room mirror standing behind her, except she said it was covered head to foot in cloth, and that the face was wrinkles in the cloth. 4. This event happened in January, 2011, to me and my friend Patrick. Patrick was visiting from France for three days, and I wanted to show him what England had to offer. As such, I had planned to take him to see Stonehenge, but the roads were too icy, so we went for a walk on the moors just outside of Tavistock in Devon instead, as Tavistock is my hometown. It had recently snowed, and so we were both wearing warm clothes and had packed a thermos flask full of coffee. I prefer tea, but he was the guest after all. As he was something of a hunting nut, he was very interested in all the tracks various animals had left in the snow. I was a little nervous, as I had recently had a scary encounter with what I can safely assume was the beast of Bodmin Moor. He had his eye on a set of tracks he could not identify. This was strange for Patrick, as he had an almost encyclopedic knowledge of animal tracks. At first, I put this down to him being from France, and that perhaps this was some creature indigenous to England. But they seemed strange to me as a novice as well. They were almost like giant human handprints in the snow, with deeper indentations at the fingertips, as if the creature had been gripping the snow. I was afraid that in following the tracks we might just stumble across the creature's lair, and while I was interested to find out what it was, I didn't want to be its supper. As we followed, we found that the left hand print was less strong, and the right was getting deeper, almost as if the creature was limping. To Patrick's disappointment and my relief, we lost the tracks at a small brook. We discussed what had happened. I reasoned that it might have been someone pulling a prank on us, just as Patrick liked to play pranks on me. Or perhaps it was just some as yet unidentified creature of the moor. But Patrick was convinced that it was a monster, like Bigfoot, 
We each failed to convince the other of our point of view, and it ended in an argument. We sat at the brook, him drinking his coffee and me smoking one of Patrick's own rolled cigarettes to calm down. As he drank and I smoked, I felt this weird wave roll over my body, followed by a hollow call, like a backward drumbeat. I turned to Patrick, and it was clear he had heard it too. Before I could ask what it was, he was off. I chased after him and called his name, but he wasn't listening. He seemed intent on following something far ahead of him. I regret to say that I am no runner, and in no time at all, Patrick had lost me. The moors are an easy place to get lost in, so I decided to retrace my steps back to the brook. To my astonishment and horror, there now seemed to be more of those handprints. The creature had circled us. And then I heard it. The hollow, throaty, resounding call of that nightmarish creature. I ran. It seemed as if the whole wood was alive. I heard creaking branches, rustling leaves, rasping winds, but most of all, again and again, I heard the cry of the beast. I arrived in a clearing and would have stormed right through it had I not noticed a shiny object on the ground. I stooped down to pick it up and realized it was my thermos flask. What had happened to Patrick? As I stood there, the noises increased tenfold. I tried to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot by fear. A crashing noise came toward me. Something was racing through the undergrowth toward me. It was Patrick. He looked rather worse for wear, cuts on his face and neck and his shirt grubbied. He refused to say what had happened, but urged me to leave the moor as soon as possible. I thought he was probably afraid of some phantom, so I indulged him, and we both headed for home. Patrick looked tired, so I offered him a drink from the flask. He refused. I offered again and got the same response. This was peculiar because Patrick was a thirsty person at the best of times, and after a jolly good run, he must have wanted some more coffee. As we reached the outskirts of Tavistock, Patrick turned around and turned as white as a sheet. I could read the terror in his eyes and knew that the monster was right behind us. I ran. Within minutes, I had reached my home and threw open the front door, and without bothering to take off my shoes, I slammed it shut behind me. Within seconds, there was a banging at my door. Terrified, I slumped up against it and expected the worst. After a few minutes, the banging subsided, and I mustered enough courage to look through the peephole and saw that the porch door was wide open. I have not seen Patrick since. I tried to ring him, but he never picked up. The thermos sits in my kitchen to this day, untouched, as I fear as to what I should find if I ever looked inside. 5. I've been a huge believer in all things paranormal for a while now. I've always loved and believed in ghost stories, poltergeist phenomena, and other things like that. Usually, the only thing that I'm skeptical about is cryptozoology. I don't believe in many of the weird creatures that people report seeing. All that changed during a class trip in my junior year of high school. We went up to the mountains for fresh air, scenery, and spending time bonding with our classmates. One of the required activities was a night hike. During the hike, my friend Chelsea and I spotted a path separate from the one that everyone else was taking. Together with our friend Sarah, we hung back until the group got ahead of us, then moved down the alternate trail. The trip itself was fairly normal. We had only one flashlight and made all the usual stupid Blair Witch jokes and making sounds to creep each other out. After about a half an hour, we started getting seriously freaked out. We were way deeper into the forest than we thought we were, and we were getting lost. We turned back because we started hearing the cliché rustling bushes. As soon as we headed back, we got the fright of our lives. Something 
huge ran across the path. Chelsea panicked, shone her flashlight on it, and it seemed to freeze in the bright light. All I can remember is that it looked like what I expect a Bigfoot to look like, except its fur had some white splotches on it, and it had large claws. Its eyes were shining red, like most animals caught in lights. It made a noise somewhere between a scream and a howl. That split-second sight of it, and the sound will stay with me for the rest of my life. I have never been more scared in my life. Just thinking of what it looked like and what it sounded like is giving me chills right now. We ran back the way we came and reached camp at least an hour before everyone else, staying in the main lobby of the camp we were staying at. We asked a few of our classmates later. They said they had heard the scream or howl, but the tour guide told them it was just a mountain lion. We left the next morning without asking any of the camp employees whether they had a run-in with the Bigfoot thing. It's been a year now, and the three of us still refuse to talk about it. I am not a cryptozoology skeptic anymore. If anyone has seen a creature like this in the California mountains, please tell me. I want to know what it was. 6. It was a few years back now. I was about 12, maybe 13. My friend and I were out camping, and we were left outside in a tent. At around 1 a.m., we heard something walking around outside our tent, and then it was scraping against our tent. My friend and I were scared, understandably, so we talked about what we should do. Just as we put on our shoes, the thing picked up our tent, ripping the stakes out of the ground and dropped us hard, four feet from where we were before. We jumped out of the tent, ready to take the thing on, and it was dead quiet, and we couldn't see a thing. But then, the clouds moved away from the moon, and we saw it. It was seven feet tall, and it was running up a huge hill just outside of our camp. We started to run after it, and when we were halfway up the hill, the thing jumped from the top of the hill and ran into a small forest without missing a beat. We then saw a strange light in the trees and a craft lifted out of the trees and took off. My friend and I climbed the rest of the way up the hill and just sat there. We were in complete shock because this thing had attacked us, and it took off without even coming back to get us again. Whether it was an alien or a Sasquatch, we will never know. But I hope to never go through that again. 7. This happened in the Tullock Ewan Castle Woods, Dumbartonshire, Scotland, in 1998, when I was 13 years old. A friend and I were going to check on rabbit snares as I was into hunting at the time. We were taking a shortcut through the woods, which are a good bit away from any houses. The closest would be about a mile and a half. We would do this fairly often. It was a warm July evening around 5 or 6 p.m., we were trekking and talking when I noticed ahead of us there was what looked like a big mound of dirt. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought a tree had fallen over and pulled its roots up. As we were getting closer to this mound that was ahead of us, I kept looking at it now and again and was starting to feel a bit on edge, as if we were being watched. I couldn't see anyone, so I continued on. When we were 50 or 60 feet away from this mound, I looked at it again. This time, I did not take my eyes off it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a big, dark, broad, hairy creature with white eyes. And it was staring right at us. It was easily 10 feet tall and was around 6 feet wide. I could see the hair on its head and in front of its eyes, blowing in the wind. I felt like I was looking at it for ages. I pointed it out to my friend who was slightly behind me. He looked at it for a second or two, turned white, looked at me, and bolted. I did the same. We ran for a solid ten minutes at full speed until we were out of the woods and back around people near our homes. We compared what we had just seen. We both saw a big, hairy, man-shaped creature with white eyes. It never seemed to have a face other than the eyes which were staring at us. We couldn't make out arms or legs either. 
but it could have been because it was so hairy. It was a kind of dirty, black, peat color. It scared me senseless, so much that I still have nightmares about it if I start thinking about it too much. It terrified me. I never believed in monsters until I saw it. We were laughed at when we told people about it, so we kept it to ourselves. If I was to make a guess as to what it was, I would say it was not a human. Definitely not a man or animal. An animal with white eyes would be blind, and big animals usually get spotted a lot. Anyone who says monsters are not real may be correct in some cases, but not all. Or in this case. I say experience is believing. I now know for a fact there is the unexplainable. 8. This is the story of the encounter I had in Sun Valley, Nevada in the summer of 2001. My family lives near the end of a cul-de-sac where one loud noise sends all the dogs in the neighborhood into a fit. Thank God for my double-pane windows. I was just dozing off when I heard a crazy, loud, deep commotion that sounded like so loud I thought that it must have been a car slamming on its brakes on my street. I waited to hear a crash, but when there was none, I decided to investigate. I looked out my window and saw nothing. There was no moon out, and in Sun Valley there are no street lights. I continued looking when I saw a large form moving from my left to right just past the trees, something moving very fast and smooth but a good five feet taller than my fence is, so of course it had to be a non-human object. Then I saw it. As it passed the tree line in my yard and into the light of my neighbor's floodlight, it stood roughly nine to ten feet tall. It was covered in hair, had huge ears, although I saw no large snout sticking out, but no direct look at the face. The huge stride explained the speed for sure. As I held my breath, it walked over to my neighbor's gate and went to open the large chain-link fence gate, just like anyone would, but then it froze absolutely still. I didn't know if it sensed me or what to think, so I slowly lowered the piece of blind I was looking through and decided that I was going to leave it alone because... Firearms or not, I might be risking my family's life if I confront something that large and powerful. Needless to say, I spent the next six days up all night with my compound bow. I've seen more while camping, too. And seeing something like that while camping can put some new adrenaline in you. But that's another story. 9. My sighting took place around 11.30 p.m. on November 4, 2009. I work for the local 73 toll road in Newport Beach, California, and lately we've had some construction on the surrounding roads for the past few months. I'm a third shift manager, 2 p.m. to 11 p.m., and every night driving home I take the exact same route at pretty much the same time every night. On this night, I was coming off the exit for the 133 road connector, and I'll never forget what I saw. While stopped at the stoplight, I saw a group of three large, four-legged creatures dash out from the trees along the road. I started second-guessing myself and tried to convince myself I was seeing things. I made the left turn at the light, and while the speed limit was still 40 miles per hour at this part, I looked up and almost peed my pants. Those three beasts were running upright. The wolves, which seems to be the most logical guess, were about six and a half feet tall and looked like they easily weighed 250 to 275 pounds each. They had snouts and mouths that almost could be expressive, being able to smile or frown, and the fur was dark, although there wasn't enough light to tell if it was dark brown or black. My car being a six-cylinder, it could get going if need be. I was going 45 miles per hour, and the giant wolves were keeping up with ease. I then literally put the pedal to the metal and sped up to 70. I was sweating profusely and having a panic attack. As I sped up to 70, the wolves stopped following me, considering I was about to enter a high-traffic part of the road. The wolf in front seemed to stop on a dime and watched me drive off. 
I did not hear any howls before or after the sighting. I proceeded to head home ASAP. I told my girlfriend what I saw, and she deemed my imagination was running wild. I also told my co-workers the next day following the sight, but nobody believes me to this day. I know I'm not crazy, and I know what I saw. I still have been taking the same route home every night and have not run into anything since that night of the sighting. Who knows what they actually were, but all I know is I do not want to run into them again. 10. Recently, my mother and I were discussing books, and The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon by Stephen King became the topic of conversation. My mother stated that she wondered as she read that story if Mr. King had experienced something which may have led to this story. This question reminded me of a terrifying experience I had when I was a child. As I would soon find out, I was not the only one to have experienced something. The validation came that it was not an overactive imagination. Then again, I already knew that. Before I begin, I would like to state for the record that I don't believe in Bigfoot, and even if I did, Bigfoot was not what I saw. This was different. We lived in southern Maine until I was almost ten. By the time my younger brother and I were well into grade school, both of my parents were working. My dad full-time, just like always, and my mother part-time. They didn't want us home alone. They tried to coordinate their schedules so that one of them would always be home with us within 10 or 15 minutes of the bus dropping us off after school. I had a house key, of course, and about the only thing we had to do was to let our dogs outside for a few minutes, for obvious reasons. I don't remember much about the day leading up to this experience, except that it was fall, fairly cool outside, and it had been a perfectly normal day. We got off the school bus, as always, and proceeded to walk around to the back of the house to let ourselves inside. The dogs anxiously greeted us, and as usual, my brother refused to help me let them out. Our shepherd was a good dog, and she wouldn't run away without a leash as long as one of us was outside with her. Our collie was still a puppy and had no sense about her at all. We had one of those long runs which led from the back deck out to a large tree in the backyard. I tied Lady up to the run, and the shepherd scooted off to do her business. I stood on the porch quietly waiting for them to finish, just like always. A couple of minutes passed, and like my normal self, I was a little impatient waiting for the dogs. Even then, I was not much of a dog-type person. Our shepherd shot past me and back into the house the second I called her. Our collie would not come to me no matter how much I called to her. She had caught wind of something and had her snoopy nose to the ground, choosing to ignore me completely. Just as I moved to run down the stairs to get her, I heard something from the woods in front of me. We lived on a heavily wooded acre of land. Although we had neighbors on all sides, we were in the country and we all had woods surrounding our houses. I remember looking up at the sound and immediately froze. What I heard were huge, giant footsteps, and what I saw was something that looked like a huge man with something white over his head and green clothing. Sounds an awful lot like Friday the 13th, right? I was eight and a half. I had not seen Friday the 13th, and Jason was unknown to me. This man, or thing, had to stand at least nine feet tall, and it sounded like he was simply stepping on fallen trees and snapping them in half. I could feel the vibrations of his footsteps from the deck. A couple of seconds felt like an eternity, and I could not move. I simply stood there watching this thing in the small clearing behind our woodshed. He, or it, stormed through our woods like he meant business. I tried to call the lady, but I could not make my voice work. I remember praying, please don't let him see me. Don't let him see me. Don't. I don't remember how, but I managed to quickly get off the porch, grab Lady, and pull her into the house as quickly as possible. Funny thing, this dog loved to bark. She didn't make one single sound. I locked the door behind us and waited for Dad. It was his day to come home early. 
I told my brother. He was seven and told me that he was going to tell on me for trying to scare him. He was too young to realize that I was not joking around. Not five minutes later, Dad arrived. I bombarded him with my story the second he walked through the door. He looked concerned, but he told me I must have seen a moose or I was remembering a bad dream. It was no dream, and it was not a moose. I was really mad at him for not listening to me. This was not like him. As I was telling my mom this story, I am now almost 27 and remember that experience as though it just happened, she smiled and said, Dad believed you. He just didn't want you to be scared. He saw something once, too. Dad used to chop our firewood. We had a large house and two wood stoves along with our furnace. He spent a lot of time in the woods behind our house chopping wood. He always seemed to love it, according to my mom, until one late afternoon. She says it must have been about a year before I saw the thing in the woods. As she spoke, I did sort of remember this incident. What I remembered was the day that my dad came walking, sort of running out of the woods. It again was autumn. I don't remember the weather. And it spooked me, thus my memory. My dad is not one to get spooked very easily. He is very level-headed. He's a main state worker. He is not a stupid man by any means. He shot up the deck and into the house like a bullet and bluntly stated, Something's out there. I'm not going back out there again. Mom asked him what it was that he saw, and he stated, I don't know what the hell it was, but it was big. Mom asked him if it was an animal. Dad, slowly calming down but still pretty agitated, said that he thought at first that it might have been a moose, big footsteps, or a buck. He even wondered if it was a bear. When he looked to see what it was, all he knew was that it wasn't an animal. He also knew that his gut was telling him to get out of the woods now. Eventually, Dad got his courage up to head out to the woods for more firewood again, but it was a good two or three weeks after that incident. To my knowledge, he never saw it again. My grandmother did, though. Our land has been divided up between my grandparents and my parents. We were literally around the corner from them. Quite frequently, we would tromp through the woods to their house, especially when we were too little to walk down the road by ourselves. We had a treehouse that could be seen by both my parents and my grandparents. Everyone could hear us, which meant that everyone could and did keep an eye on us. One afternoon, my grandmother had been outside working in her small flower garden when she heard something. She heard footsteps and the cracking of branches. Thinking it was me, I was always sneaking over to see her, she stood up and saw instead what she could only refer to as a monster. She, like Dad and me, could not figure out what it was. She said it looked in her direction and just kept going. My grandmother ran inside, locked the doors, and refused to step outside for a couple of days. To this day, she does not know what it was. She still calls it a monster. For the record, I would also like to say that she had no prior knowledge of this thing. Dad never told her about what he saw. For one thing, he had felt silly. Secondly, he didn't want to frighten my grandmother. I was little, so no one believed me. At least, not that they would admit. I fully realize that this is not your average ghost story. It's more like an X-Files case. But the difference is that it is all true. In these strange yet true stories is proof that the world is a strange place. If you have any strange stories that you would like us to read and share please send them to strangebuttruestories at gmail.com. I'm Steve White. Until next time.